So there are 42 soldiers in a large bomb crater that no one knew about until I made my first visit back to the site to try and do some mental healing. And I spent the last 10 years looking for this gravesite. What I have come to realise uh, is by going back to the point of where the post-traumatic stress erupted from is a healing process within itself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight metre bomb crater. I was always checking behind my back, always looking behind my back. If I went into a cafe or a restaurant, I would always sit in a position where I could see the door. It was an escape route. I needed to be able to reassure myself that you know, I had an escape route and I knew exactly where it was. Uh, stupid things like that, which uh, all manifestations of post-traumatic stress. Uh, sorry, start, start uh, here and go out. Yes? Okay, out that way. And... In 2011, when the Australian government became involved in the search through the defence attaché in Hanoi, he took on the task as a form of saying thank you to the Vietnamese as the Vietnamese put in an extraordinary amount of um, assistance in finding the six remaining Australian MIAs. So he wanted to say, well, you know, thank you for helping us. Now it's time for us to help you. We'll make a concerted effort in trying to locate these 42. Okay, where do I go now to try and find some information as to approximately where the bomb crater might be? My first thoughts were, okay, I'll approach some of the guys out of our own section that I knew were involved. Well, that was a bad mistake. The mistake being is most of our guys are suffering post-traumatic stress. As soon as I approached them and said, uh, now, can I want to talk to you about Balmoral, they switched off. They at some oh, times I... were quite <laughs> rude. Don't want to talk mind. about it. Don't want to know about it. Use the words, yes. fuck off. It's just dry sore. There's no clay in it. It's come off the surface as the digger has gone through and turned it. But there is the bottom of the crater. We eventually arrived at the, the site of Balmoral, a little later than I'd have liked because of all of these contacts. Uh, we were there in, you know, I think about one, one in the afternoon. And uh, then there was this relentless business of, of digging in a new position. But in front of the position was a very large expanse of, uh, of um, flat country uh, that had obviously been a dried out swamp or something. But it had uh, some craters created by B-52 bombers. Uh, and I said at the time that they looked like, it looked like a golf course with all these sand bunkers around. So we had the area secured, uh, the rest of the, the uh, battalion flown in, they were in by two o'clock, uh, everyone was in position well and truly by three and semi dug in, dug in 
defensive wire, at least partly out for the first night. Well, we were lucky because it, it worked. Uh, they, they didn't attack us on the first night, but they sure attacked us on the second night. But by then we had wire up and, even better, we had a troop of tanks with us. Of course, they bought huge firepower. The, the tank is capable of, you know, 50 calibre machine guns, 7.62 machine gun, but of course the big main armament. And what, what was splendid to have in that case was the canister round, which fired uh, literally hundreds of uh, pellets, if you like, uh, like a massive shotgun. They had a big weapon, which was a 20 pounder, which was, could do in, in direct fire right at the enemy. We didn't move them in until dark uh, so that they didn't know their tanks were there. And when they did attack on the second night, with our tanks nicely in position and D Company well prepared, B Company well prepared, they were stopped. They very brave soldiers, these Vietnamese. They almost got to the wire and of course they were shot. 2.30 in the morning I had just finished my picket duty and I heard the first primer of a mortar. Now the primer is a small bang that sends the mortar into the air. The first real evidence of the attack was the mortars firing us, probably 60 millimetre mortar. Uh, so everyone hightails it into their weapon pit. And the very first mortar round was a direct hit within our dug-in position, within our lines. And they had the technique of being able to walk the mortars through our lines. So every mortar hit its position. There was not one mortar that was out of position or landed outside our, our lines. Unfortunately, a few of the guys decided to sleep above ground rather than in their dug-in pits. And most of those were the guys that were either injured or killed. We lost five men that night. And the NVA decided to assault us across the clearing, which was a very unusual tactic. There's uh, uh, tracer bullets flying, there's uh, um, mortars and artillery f firing, um, there were helicopter gunships brought in, there were the spooky aircraft with the illumination provided over the battlefield. The ground assault started. 50 metres away. 50 metres away. So by the time you get your head out of your hole and get yourself together, the NVA were basically on our wire. Paul Donnelly called out to me uh, and uh, he yelled out to me, Bridey, get up here. And I yelled back, get fucked Donnelly, I'm not getting out of there. My position was actually behind a tank, of all things, to give covering support for a tank. Whoever thought a tank would need covering support. The meaning of that is if the enemy broke through our wire, they would be wanting to knock out that tank as quickly as possible. My position was to get rid of the enemy if they broke through the wire. I, I could hear his machine gun firing. He called out again. And I could feel the feeling and the, the tenseness in his voice. It was, get up here. I said, fuck you, Donnelly. We are in a good position, but we were hugely outnumbered. I called up to Paul Donnelly's gun pit, and when I went to get inside his gun pit, he said, you can't get in here. I said, well, what the fuck did you call me up here for? We put up flares. We were able to see the NVA were right on our wire. The machine gunners obviously took... took um, targeted their fire on the enemy that were on our wire. It was just fever pitched firing. The barrel of Paul Donnelly's gun was absolutely red hot and the gun would stop firing. 
We poured our water bottles on the gun to cool it down, to keep the gun operable. When we run out of water, we had to actually piss on the gun. Literally piss on the gun. And it's very hard to piss when you're sort of a little bit an adrenaline rush, but we had to actually do that. So Paul said, uh, we're going to need another gun barrel. So I ran back in through the lines once again, doing the same thing, yelling out that it was me, don't shoot. Has anyone got a spare gun barrel? Lindsay Workman, who we affectionately known as Lugsy, called out to me from his weapon pit that he'd had a gun barrel. So he gave me his spare gun barrel, which I took back up to Paul. The second night, the enemy attacked the same way. I don't know why, but they came across the open ground. But by now, we could actually start to see them move. Once again, the same tactic. When the mortars had stopped, their men were up onto our defence perimeter. And it was just wave after wave after wave, hence continual firing. The amount of rocket fire that was coming into our position aimed at our machine gun and the tank was non-stop. That uh I thought it was extremely wasteful of manpower. They, uh, they just, as you say, human wave attacks uh, and lost tremendous numbers as a result. There was two very large bomb craters approximately 50 metres outside our, our, our defence wire. The enemy used those uh, bomb craters as hides and as firing positions. Another rocket hit a tree which was about uh, three metres behind me and my buddy. Uh, that destroyed everything that was above ground. It destroyed my rifle, all my equipment, uh, Everything, everything had to be replaced. For, so for the rest of the night, I'm sitting there, squatting there, lying there, trembling without a weapon. I'm, I'm not a, a religious person, but this was one time in my life that I actually prayed. First time ever that I've actually believed that that possibly there is a God, and if there is, I need his assistance right now. The battlefield was littered with bodies, body parts, drag marks, dumped equipment. We found that they were, in the main, young, very young fellows. Uh, probably teenagers, a lot of them. Um, but they were fanatically driven and, uh, and that was the problem. Well, I probably didn't think about it again until we saw all these mangled bodies being thrown into one of the bomb craters uh, to be buried. And I thought, goodness, this is a terrible outcome. What are we doing here? But then you move on, you get on with the job. Uh, and there's no opportunity to, to question in, in any deep way what we're on about. In my company alone, buried 42 uh, North Vietnamese the next morning. Pulled them off the, the wire entanglements and from around the immediate vicinity. The obvious thing was to bury them in situ. Now, it would have been very nice to have had individual burials, but... Uh, the quickest, the most convenient way was to put them as a communal grave in these uh, uh, bomb craters. I, I like to think we handle, handled them with respect, um, but it's a job that had to be done and done quickly. Basically, that was the end of Operation Tone Thang. These 42 soldiers were buried en masse in a very large bomb crater.